Excellent. Uh, it's, a, it's a very great pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to speak to you about uh, the research work I've been involved in uh, over the last 20 uh, uh, years or so, um, which is on high pressure uh, technology. In fact, I am the UK representative of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering on high pressure technology. Um, much of my work has been in working with industry, uh, working on the um, study of uh, motor fuels, um, and uh, particularly for performance fuels. Uh, this is a photograph I took at the 24-hour uh, Le Mans uh, last year. It's taken at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not going to talk to you about uh, uh, this type of technology with, uh, with motorsport, because where's the glamour in motorsport? Instead, I'm going to talk to you about food. food. And I'm just going to tie a link in with uh, Joe's presentation, which was to do with pollution and, uh, and the need for water, good water um, quality. And you'll see from this diagram here that while there is an awful lot of water to be found around the Earth's surface, not much of it is actually available to a large proportion of the population on this planet. If that's not a tale of gloom, then try this one. When I was uh, born, there were three billion people on this planet. I looked it up at half past five today. There are seven billion, 345 million people today on this planet. That's a lot of people. It's more than doubled, and it's still increasing rapidly. And by 2050, it's projected that there will be nine billion people on this planet. We're going to be joined by another two billion people in just a generation. That's a phenomenal number of people. All of these people require water, they all require sanitation, they all require energy, and significantly, they all require to be fed. This particular diagram here, this photograph, uh, this, uh, this, this image here shows, in a sort of a topographic way, the expansion of those countries in terms of population growth. And you can see that whilst China may have stabilized itself, India, and a number of the African countries are increasing massively. You'll also see, interestingly, a few of the so-called developed countries um, actually contracting, and Australia is an unusual shape there. All these people will be joining us. They all require to be fed, which means we need to have a way in which we can feed them. We know, what we, uh, we know how to produce food. We know where to, uh, where to obtain it. But how do we get it from, quite literally, from, from farm to fork? There's a lot of processing that goes on in between, the bit that we don't see. We don't farm as a nation anymore, as individuals. Instead, we go to our supermarkets and we buy food which is processed. And we buy food which is processed because it's going to be convenient, it's affordable, and it satisfies our daily needs. Every day, we all eat, and we will continue to eat. But exactly what goes on in in the, process of, of, uh, in the process of quite literally processing food. So what do we want out of, out of a food? Well, we want food which is high quality. We want it which is minimally processed. And by that, I mean with the smallest amount of intervention by somebody who's had their hands on the food we put into our mouths. We want food which is, to the best part, natural. We want it to be additive free. We want it to be high in nutritional value. We want it to be, quite literally, safe to eat. And processing foods isn't a new concept. It's been done for hundreds of years. Vasco da Gama, uh, who pioneered a route into uh, the Indian Ocean, uh, the Portuguese explorer, uh, was no newcomer to the need for food on his voyages. Uh, suffering the ravages of scurvy, um, of one of his crews, of 160, 100 died from scurvy, and presumably, presumably the remaining 60 weren't in good shape either. He took processed foods with him of a, of a type, but it wasn't for over 250 years later when James Cook and James Lint, his physician, figured out that actually if you, if you took fresh fruit and vegetables with you, you could actually keep at bay the ravages of scurvy. And even today, in fact, uh, British people are known in the pejorative sense as limeys. And inter interestingly, it took another 100 years for the British Navy to figure out that James Cook 
was on a winning formula, didn't understand that it was out down to a vitamin, that came yet another hundred years later, but nonetheless, but nonetheless uh, it, took a, it took the British Navy to the 19th century to figure out that fresh fruit and veg should be eaten on your long voyages. And then, of course, we're faced with a whole load of other issues as well associated with the food that we eat. Uh, this is probably uh, a more recent one that we can all think about, that uh, the food that we eat, that we buy, ought to be the food that's labelled on the packaging. But, you know, there's dozens and dozens of food scandals that we've had, uh, quite apart from the famine in, in Africa, but, and, and also another scandal, which is food wastage. Uh, every household, by the way, averages out somewhere in the order of about 460 pounds of waste per year. That's a lot of waste that we waste, uh, sorry, per, per household. Uh, and then there's issues associated with GM crops. The, the, is, uh, how ethical is that? Um, particularly in light of the fact that we need to uh, uh, feed a nation. There's other ones, I've just picked out a few that you'll remember, the glycerol in Austrian wines, uh, Listeria, of course, Campylobacter, uh, E. coli 0157, which we uh, would remember very well in Scotland. Uh, the um, halal uh, lamb burgers, which, uh, which contain pork, not good. Um, uh, condemned chicken that was uh, brought in from Brazil and of course the, the horse meat scandal. So question, um, food is massively processed, do we know what it is we're eating? The main approaches to, uh, to processing food generally are thermal, that means cooking, we do it at home, we, we bake, we fry, we boil, we do many other things and here for example is a, is a case of a boiled egg where what it basically means is you heat the outside and the temperature will migrate through to the center might be okay for a soft uh, boiled egg that's not a problem but when it comes down to something like chicken here uh, it gets overcooked on the outside but the inside remains raw that's not good okay now you might want to have an overcooked outside of a chicken that's nice has certain flavors There's lots of chemical reactions that take place there but it's the inside bit that's not going to do you any harm uh, that's going to do you harm, not do, do any good. This new technology that I've been involved in, quite apart from the, the diesel fuels, is the use of high pressure on foods. And all you have to do is very, very simple. You simply put your food inside a pressure vessel, add uh, a, a, a a hydraulic fluid around the outside, pressurise it up to a high temperature for a certain period of time, unpack it, and you're ready to go. And what you get is is a is a food which is safe to eat. You have killed all the potentially contaminating microorganisms inside, but there's also some other advantages as well. So all you have to do, very, very simple, you take your food, you load it into a long tube, like a cannon, if you like, fill up um, the outside with, with water, that's, uh, that's safe, it's not going to do us any harm, don't put in uh, hydraulic fluids, that's not good. Um, Pressurise it, in other words, just squash it down a bit, compress all the molecules, and then finally unload it. And that is exactly what is now being done with a wide range of foods. But I use the word pressure, and what do we mean by pressure? So I've actually brought some props. I have brought some props. There they are, some props. A few, few, few foods here. So this is, uh, this is a bottle of beer uh, made by Abertain, incidentally, and it's under pressure. So if I just open this, <laughs> well, I won't, but it's under pressure. Okay, and the pressure here is equivalent of about uh, the bottom of a, of, a, of a swimming pool. When you dive down to the swimming pool, you feel your ears pop. That's the pressure inside here. Not a lot of pressure, but nonetheless, it's, if you like, the weight of the water pressing down. The pressure that I'm talking about is pretty high. If you go down to the bottom of the deepest ocean, the really deepest ocean, the Mariana Trench, off the southern coast of Japan, where there are weird and wonderful creatures. We are talking about a thousand times higher than atmospheric pressure. That's pretty high. There are, amazingly, life forms down at that depth. But I'm not talking about that pressure, because that's low pressure for me. So you need to multiply that by about 10. Okay, what does that mean? It means if you had a column of liquid and you support it on your hand, it would be, a bit, it would be about uh, 60 miles high. Okay, that's quite a high pressure. How do we do that? Uh, well, we do that in the lab here. It's quite a simple way of doing it. You need a vessel, first of all, which has got a lot of um, steel. So it's quite thick-walled. But you use what's called a pressure multiplier. So it's like a drawing pin, if you like, that presses down onto a sharp point. 
So if I stood on a drawing pin, the pressure is my weight over a very, very small area. The type of pressures I'm talking about, the equivalent of two elephants on a small drawing pin. That's the pressure I generate. It's quite literally that. It is a drawing pin, if you like, inside um, what's called a pressure multiplier. And you can press, press, pressurize the vessel up to these incredible pressures. And that's an example of a polystyrene cup um, which has been shrunk down. This is a technique which is used by the food industry in this country, in Europe, in America, in Japan, which is where it was first pioneered about 20 years ago. And there's a phenomenal success uh, in many places of the world. Uh, to get a continuous process, you can imagine if you actually have to load a vessel, empty it, sorry, load up a vessel, pressurize it and empty it, it takes time. But you can run a continuous process by having three. One's being loaded, one's been operated, and one's been emptied. You just run them on a cycle. And what you get is a continuous out, outflow of, uh, of product. You've probably never heard of food being high pressure processed. And of course, by high, pre high pressure processing, what, what actually happens is, is that the pressure actually has an interaction with the delicate molecular structure of the foods, but not the stronger molecules, uh, sorry, the um, uh, bonds that hold the whole thing together, which is what heat does. So when you overheat something, you kind of break stuff down. High pressure, on the other hand, is, is much more selective. It only deals with very, um, um, with, with those bonds which are, are fairly easy to, uh, to, to, to damage and in, interact, leaving foods effectively minimally processed. You don't over-process them. So here's, here's, uh, here's something from Morrison's. Uh, well, there, look, you wouldn't have noticed it. Up in the top corner, it says high pressure process. So you already have consumed this type of product. Now, of course, I'm going to be a bit biased here. I would have had a label that said high pressure process. And in the top corner, it would have said, by the way, it's freshly, orange, freshly squeezed orange juice. But I'm a bit biased here on this one. But you might have come across some other ones. Here's some more that, have, um, that appear in uh, delicatessens and supermarkets. And there's many others. And there's lots of other uh, benefits you get from high pressure processing as well, because it only interacts with the delicate um, bonding of the, uh, of the foods. It can influence the textural properties of the food. And also the colour as well. In fact, it denatures proteins in the same way that when you boil an egg, it turns a solid white. I have some eggs here, actually. It turns uh, a solid uh, white colour. That's because you're denaturing the, uh, the, the, the proteins here. The use of high pressure, unlike the earlier photograph I showed you of the egg, boiling egg, which is where you have the heat from the outside to the inside, soft boiled egg, high pressure applies, is applied uniformly. The inside to the outside, the whole lot, no discrimination, the whole lot is processed at the same time at any point in the food. So that's a, a unique advantage. So it can render foods, um, well, it can produce foods which are um, uh, textually different. A lot of work being done in Japan in producing all sorts of textural uh, properties. Um, but here's another um, fascinating example of, of the use of high pressure. And it's the, it's the shucking or opening of, of oysters. High pressure has traditionally, uh, sorry, uh, shucking of oysters has traditionally involved the use of a sharp knife cutting open the oyster with lots of knife injuries for which medieval gauntlets are worn, operated by um, cheap labor, dare I say it. But over in Mississippi Delta, they developed uh, um, this technology where quite literally, for the very first time, o oysters will naturally shut. Why? Because the muscle joint that holds the shell together is relaxed, it's softened up. By denaturing the proteins, you've just melted it, if you like. That's not a technical term. And it very readily opens. So knife injuries just disappeared. Uh, yields um, have uh, increased massively. Um, it's, it's a remarkable success story. But here's, uh, sorry about this, uh, you may have had your tea, uh, but this one here. What the high pressure does, just like when you thermally process food, when you heat foods, is to make it safe to eat, like the chicken, for example. With use of high pressure, it will eradicate harmful microorganisms. So here we have um, Listeria and E. coli, for example, reducing in numbers with time at a particular pressure. And in the case of something like Vibrio volnificus, that's the nasty bug you get in shellfish. You know you've had it 
about 24 hours after you've had the dodgy shellfish. You know that's when you don't know which end to point towards the toilet. It really has much more harmful effects, that very microorganism, much more harmful effects than just feeling pretty bad for the day. Um, but the use of the high pressure, interestingly, from, from work which is done on understanding the uh, eradication or reduction of the uh, microorganisms is that ultimately you've got to have a sterile product. If you've got one microorganism still surviving, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes six, um, becomes eight, 16, etc., they multiply back up again. And, uh, and if, if those of you are interested, and I'll talk to you later, um, this type of graph here will never get down to zero. You can get down to fractions of a living microorganism, which sounds absurd. You can't have something which is half alive or half dead. More on that another time. But here's another benefit, yet another benefit of high pressure processing. The only bit of chemistry I've, I've thrown in for you, because here is uh, another, uh, another, another prop, which is, which is if you can influence the, um, the, the delicate structure of proteins, and one of those is, is enzymes, then if I just, sorry, use my knife here, with a banana here, then we all know that when we cut open a banana, it doesn't take too long before it starts to go black. And here's, in the true Blue Peter sense, here's the one I prepared earlier. Okay, so what we're actually doing here is breaking open the living cells, releasing polyphenols, which, with the release of an enzyme, in the presence of oxygen, that's air, forms an oxidized state, which are black. Right, it's quite safe to eat. It just doesn't look good. When your guests turn up for your fruits, for your food for the meal and you've produced a fruit salad that's black, or possibly he says an avocado, an avocado, which has also gone black, there's a fresh one here, um, you might want to do something about it. We know how to deal with it at home. We can use lemon juice to interact with the enzyme. But what we can do with the, the high pressure is high pressure process banana. Change the shape inactivate the enzyme, it never goes black. And why would you want to do that? Well, baby food for a start. And there's many other examples. This one here is on uh, olive oil, some uh, work that I've uh, been working on uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a company. Um, just understanding how the viscosity, how the thickness or thinness of, of a food can be influenced by the use of high pressure. So in other words, put it into a vessel, pressurize it up, and you can get some interesting, interesting effects. Uh, this is, looks rather complicated here. What, what actually happens here is very simple. To, wait to, to measure the, uh, the, the, the viscosity, you simply drop a small sinker down through a tube, and you time it, the, how long it takes to go between two, uh, you can just see up there, detection coils. It's as simple as that, and that piece of equipment is here at the university. It sits inside a big ve pressure vessel. Here's another one. Here's another application of high pressure. You never we go. Um, ice cream. You make ice cream at home, it's quite hard to do because when you form ice cream, then you form ice crystals. And if you're very clever, you keep taking out the ice cream from the over of your freezer and breaking up the ice crystals. Because otherwise it's crunchy ice cream, not very good. What you can do is this. I have to show you this. It's a bit of a thermodynamic diagram, but it's, it's worth having a look at. There we go. Start off with your, your ice cream mix. It's about room temperature. And but look at this which freezes at zero, but if you increase the pressure, look at this, it actually freezes at minus 22. Minus 20, we didn't know that. Water freezes at minus 22 degrees centigrade at 200, uh, well, twice the depths of the, uh, the deepest ocean. Let's call it that. So what you do is this, pressurize, chill it down, and then rapidly decrease the pressure. How do you do that? Turn a valve knock off the pressure, back to, back to atmospheric, and you immediately enter back into the ice region, rapidly forming ice. So ladies and gentlemen, here are some of the food applications for high pressure processing. It is possible to effectively boil an egg without actually using any temperature. You can do that. You can turn an egg ex white exactly as, you, as you've seen. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Uh, for your attention. This is the last, uh, my last slide, effectively. It's actually almost my last slide. This is the first, uh, the first uh, shot, apparently, from the, uh, the Mars rover. <laughs> and if you're really interested in complicated chemical engineering, I do have one last slide. It's a lot of information, but if you just get a chance to read it, I can send it to you. It's how to make a meringue, lemon meringue pie. Thank you very much.